Hello, thank you for joining us. My name is Austin Holmes and I'm from the Terry Eye Institute. Today we'll be discussing smart device ophthalmic photography. This lecture was recently given at the 2014 Askers meeting and we thought we would upload it to the internet. These are some of the topics we'll be discussing. We'll be breaking it down into four parts. In the first series, we'll be discussing the creation of smart device photography, why we take photographs, and some photography fundamentals. First, I'd like to show you a little video we put together. Um, we hope you enjoy it. Julie, with this new device, I can show you what your eye looks like. Take a look. Now I understand what you've been trying to explain to me. It's truly amazing. Use Evernote to record the pictures, to send them to your computer, and to zoom the pictures to show the patient later on. Using video, we can do dynamic tear film analysis. Here you see it in a color form, and there it is in fluorescein. You can watch the blink and analyze the tear film. You can wirelessly print your photos. Here you see sending the photo to the printer, and here it is. Since the camera is so portable, it can be brought to any room, and the pictures can be taken by everyone. You can use it in room two, or in room six. Always available, never miss a shot. Since the photos and videos are in the cloud, they are available to all doctors at any location. Let's talk about the evolution of an idea or why smart device ophthalmic photography was developed. When you think of slit lamp photography, you think of a dedicated device and dedicated room that requires specially trained technicians. One of the biggest problems with this is it's not very portable or efficient. You have to move the patients around a lot and it takes a while for the pictures to upload onto the server to be able to view them in the exam room. To solve some of these issues, we started off by trying to hold up a DSLR camera in front of the eyepiece. There's a couple problems with this. First, it's not very quick or efficient as well. It takes a little effort to get it centered up and focused properly. And the second issue is that it doesn't have the connectivity uh, that we would like. However, with the advent of modern technology, specifically smart devices, a lot of these issues have been solved. With these, we can go anywhere and we can show anyone the photographs we take. And thus the iPhotodoc was born. As you can see, we've developed an adapter that allows the iPhone to be slid over the eyepiece for quick, efficient photography in the exam lane. Over time, the iPhotodoc evolved from just an adapter into an idea, the idea that we like to call the modern ophthalmic photography system. What this is, is that we truly believe that smart devices are the wave of the future in ophthalmic photography. Based on that, we've created adapters not only for the iPhone, but also for the iPad and the iPad mini. And each one of these devices has pros and cons, which we'll discuss in a little bit more detail later in this lecture. But the big question is, why should we even spend the time necessary to photograph? And this is of special interest to me because I did my master's thesis for my public health degree in the use of slit lamp photography to improve patient-physician communication. And that's what I believe this is really, truly about, patient communication. Patients aren't trained medical professionals, and some of the terminology that we take for granted is completely lost on the patient as this cartoon depicts. The biggest advantage that photographs give us is that they help us to simplify the information that we need to convey to our patients. After all, a picture is worth a thousand words. 
I wanted to share with you a couple quotes from a journal article that I found very interesting. I'm just going to focus on the sentences highlighted in blue. Patients who understand their doctors are more likely to acknowledge health problems, understand their treatment options, and follow their medication schedules. In other words, they have better health outcomes. But the first step is taking quality photographs that are clinically useful, and for that we need to review some photography fundamentals. The fundamentals we're going to talk about are devices to use, apps, photography versus videography, magnification, and exposure. As we discussed before, we make adapters for the iPhone, the iPad, and the iPad mini. So which one's the best device to use? And that really depends on what you're looking to use it for. The iPhone is very compact and portable. It has the highest meg megapixel camera out of all the devices. It has an 8 megapixel camera. But one of the biggest drawbacks is that the screen is very small and it's not very good for patient education. Whereas the iPad has the largest screen. It's really great for patient education. But unfortunately it's not compact and it only has a 5 megapixel camera. In our clinic, we happen to use the iPad mini mostly because it has the larger screen than the iPhone, so it's really good for patient education. It's portable, but it only has a 5 megapixel camera, which is actually adequate for most types of photographs, as we'll see later on. One of the biggest questions that we get is, which app should I use for photography? There's two that we usually recommend and typically use ourselves. The first one, the one that we mostly use, is the native camera app that comes with the phone. And that one's good for basic photography. One of the drawbacks to the native camera app is that it only allows you to set the focus and exposure together. And sometimes that is not a good thing. So when we have to do more advanced photography with different light settings, we typically use the Pro Camera app, which is really good for this advanced photography because as you can see, we can adjust the focus and the exposure separately. It gives us ISO settings, which is uh, essentially the level of exposure, and it also gives us shutter speed as well too. But for most things, this is a little bit too advanced. Another question that we commonly get is, should I photograph or should I video? Now the way I like to think of it is if a photograph is worth a thousand words, a video is worth a thousand more. But it might be too expensive because the files are a little bit larger. But this is a good demonstration as I have a photograph that I pulled from the video to the right. And let me go ahead and play that now, video, video so you can see. And, I, and we're going to have you blink now. And you can see with the blink that there's still some globular mucus in it and there's a dry spot on the very bottom. And if you notice the lid, it just doesn't close. There it goes. It just doesn't close as completely as it could. Now there's an increased mucus. Now, as we saw um, from that video that Dr. Terry dictated into, there's a couple advantages. One is that you can dictate into it. It gives us a little bit better of an idea when we view the video in the future, what was occurring at that time. The second thing is that it gives us a very good dynamic analysis of what the blink is doing and what the tear film is doing. And this helps to highlight certain findings that aren't so obvious on the pictures. Next, I'd like to talk about magnification. There's two ways to magnify an image while you're taking the photograph. The first, which we're most familiar with, is optical zoom, the magnification changer on the slit lamp. The second way is to electronically zoom with the stretch to zoom feature on the smart devices. There's pros and cons to both, and before we discuss that, we need to discuss a very important concept. This concept is called the depth of field, and this is the ability to simultaneously focus on objects at different focal planes. And in this example, I held a ruler at about a 45 degree angle, and I focused on the 6. And as the ruler moves away from the slit lamp, you notice that it becomes blurry. The area where it's still clear is the length of my field, or otherwise known as the depth of field. When deciding which magnification technique to use, there's a couple different factors that we need to take into consideration. The first one is the depth of field. When we optically magnify an image, we decrease the depth of field, whereas when we 
electronically magnify the image, it maintains the depth of field. And you can see that in the uh, examples that I give. Um, if you look at the red arrow, you notice that on the left picture, that little smudge mark it's pointing towards is a little bit, or quite a bit blurry, whereas um, in the right image, it's still clear. Another consideration is the resolution. When you optically magnify an image, this actually maintains the resolution. As you can see by the blue arrow, it's still very clear that 6 in the left-hand image. Whereas when you electronically zoom an image, it decreases the resolution. As you can see at the blue arrow on the right picture, that 6 is a little bit blurry. It becomes a little bit pixelated. The last consideration is illumination. When you optically magnify an image, you need to turn up the light just a little bit to maintain the illumination. When you electronically magnify an image, however, you can leave the light setting exactly the same. The last concept we're going to discuss in this series is exposure, and I believe this is the most important photography fundamental of this series. It's very important that you have a properly exposed photograph to get the full amount of detail. I just wanted to give you an example of what a properly exposed photograph, an underexposed photograph, and an overexposed photograph looks like as a general concept. Clinically, this is what it looks like. And luckily, with both of the camera apps that we discussed in today's series, you can adjust the exposure. And this is done by tapping on the screen. And you can see where I've tapped on the screen by where the blue box is and where the red arrow is pointing towards. Now, one of the major problems with auto exposure is that it's automatic. So every time you try to adjust the illumination, it automatically adjusts the exposure level. And that's not a good thing. So while we're phot photographing, we want to lock down the exposure. And the way you do that is you, you just hold down on the screen where you want to set the exposure. Let me show you a video of how that works. In this video, I put up a model eye on this slit lamp. And I have the slit beam coming in from the left side of the image. And you, you can see that very bright area on the left side. Let me go ahead and play the video. And when you tap in the darker area, it increases the exposure, whereas when you tap on the very bright area, it decreases the exposure. There it is again. And once you find the proper exposure, which is usually in the center of the photograph, right there, you hold it down, it blinks, and that sets the auto exposure lock. And you'll see in the upper part where it says AEAF lock. So that concludes this series. Next time we'll be talking about lighting techniques and how to apply those to uh, clinical photography. We'll see you next time.